Yeah, welcome to the second talk of the DG guest tonight. Um, this talk is going to be in English uh, because it's about a European initiative. It's about uh, Reclaim Your Face. Um, Ella will uh, take over the main part. Ella works uh, for, for Edri. Hello, Ella. Um, and she will explain why uh, a ban of uh, biometric mass surveillance is so important and uh, what yeah, this, uh, the, what is the state of the laws at the moment and why do we do uh, support this uh, initiative. And, um, and we'll have uh, two, two short videos from, from Italy and from uh, Bielefeld and uh, see what, what other uh, organizations are doing because uh, the Reclaim Your Face campaign is, I don't know how many, how, how many initiatives are in there. Uh, quite a few. 68. 68. Wow. Wow. That's a, that's quite a bit. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, but before we start, we do have the honor of a world premiere of a short film explaining uh, what Reclaim Your Face is all about. It's an animation film by Alexander Lehmann. And the film will be available under uh, CC licenses after this talk at uh, Media CCC, Digital Courage and um, well the the regular uh, sources I guess you know them okay so uh, let's let's uh, watch the watch the video first eh? at a time when injustice is growing populists and racists are on the rise as we are also trying to combat discrimination based on appearance and origin, the EU supports the research and use of technology that further intensifies these problems. Biometric mass surveillance systems. The hope associated with this is understandable. More security, more efficiency, less crime. But from a scientific point of view, it is not justified because every artificial intelligence has to be trained with selected data, so it always learns the unconscious biases of its programmers. In practice, they are self-reinforcing, fully automated and incredibly fast. These people cause problems quite often. They need to be watched more closely. These people cause problems quite often. They need to be watched more closely. These people cause problems quite often. They need to be watched more closely. These people cause problems quite often. They need to watch more closely. And if you are thinking, oh, that doesn't concern me, I have nothing to hide, it is worth looking at how this typically progresses. Even harmless looking systems, which were initially intended only for convenient selective identification, are subsequently also used for large scale monitoring. It makes sense. If the technology exists, it was expensive to purchase and it can recognize suspects. Up until now, virtually every system that was potentially capable of surveillance has sooner or later been used for it. And with biometric data, it becomes especially dangerous. For example, even without your knowledge, your face can end up in databases, which can always identify you everywhere, completely automatically. If your data is then shared or sold on and linked with other data, it could have a devastating impact on your life. Your credit worthiness, for example, could be restricted. You could lose just your freedom to travel, or you could lose all your freedom. But even if a perfect, safe, fair, and completely neutral monitoring system existed, there would always be a side effect, the so-called chilling effect. According to this effect, people who feel that they are being watched automatically behave in a more conformist way because they want to avoid attracting attention. As a result, resistance to injustice and solidarity within society decrease with far-reaching consequences. But the EU has the opportunity to stop this trend now. Help us and reclaim our public space. Claim your rights to privacy, to freedom of speech, to protest, and to freedom from discrimination. What we need now are fair, non-discriminatory systems with a human sense of proportion and reason. This creates jobs and frees up urgently needed resources. Because the biggest problems that threaten our security cannot be solved with biometric surveillance, profiling, and associated questionable fortune-telling. On the contrary, these are an additional danger to our rule of law and our most important fundamental rights. 
So signed the European Citizens Initiative for a new law, for a ban on biometric mass surveillance. ReclaimYourFace.eu Yeah, so thank you very much to Alexander Lehmann and uh, the KS Computer Club for producing this video. I know talking about mass surveillance at an event like this is always like uh, preaching to the choir, but I think uh, the video is uh, very helpful if you want to explain others uh, what the whole problem is all about. And also all your 10,000s of hackers out there, please sign this petition. <laughs> so, um, now... Uh, uh, Ella, um, I give give the word to you, um, and you're gonna, yeah, uh, explain us what what the uh, initiative and um, the ECI is all about, right? That's exactly what I'm gonna do. So thank you, Epunk, and I will jump into it right now. Hopefully, you can see my slides. Yes, we do. Fantastic. All right, I will get straight to it then. Um, hello, RC3. I'm Ella Jakubowska coming live to you from Brussels, the home of EU law and policy making. So it's quite convenient that I work here for an organization called EDRI, European Digital Rights, which probably many of you are familiar with. Um, I work as a policy analyst, researcher and a campaigner against biometric mass surveillance and on lots of other digital rights topics as well. And I'm one of the coordinators um, and I helped to found and, and shape the Reclaim Your Face campaign along with, well, the now 68 organizations that are a part of the movement. Um, we started with just 12, so we've come such a fantastic way in a really short space of time. Um, and I'm going to try and, and uh, outline kind of a bit more about biometric mass surveillance, some real examples of it from across Europe, because we're not talking in hypotheticals here. Um, we're not scaremongering. We're actually talking about real things that are happening right now with real consequences for people's lives. And then I'll talk just a touch about the political context and why it's so important that we all act now and do everything we can to ban biometric mass surveillance. Um, so yeah, you've already heard a little bit about Reclaim Your Face, but as a recap, we're a coalition of European and international organizations fighting against biometric mass surveillance. And when we refer to biometric mass surveillance or BMS, uh, that's us referring to the phenomenon where governments or corporations are pervasively tracking us using our most sensitive and intimate characteristics, our faces, our bodies, and our behaviors. And they're doing this across time and place, as you saw in Alexander's wonderful video, obliterating our privacy and anonymity. And when we're talking about BMS, we're, we're thinking very much about the use of these systems, these devices in our public and publicly access accessible spaces, um, because if these these systems are in use in those spaces. It stops us from having a free choice to participate in public life uh, and in public services. And it's already happening across European public spaces like streets, parks, supermarkets, hospitals, college campuses, football stadiums, train stations, and much, much more. And although facial recognition is probably the best known type of biometric mass surveillance, when we're talking about BMS, we're, we're talking about so much more than just faces. Um, we're talking about gait, which is the way people walk. We're talking about specific bits of people's faces. We're even seeing research being done that looks to uniquely identify people by their breath. Um, so creating breath prints, um, even the way that people smell, you know, our, our individual scents being used to uniquely identify us, which can then track us across time and place. So really there's, there's no frontier of our identities of our existence, of our bodies, what makes us us that isn't being experimented right now as a way to surveil and track us. And we're seeing it being done through you know, traditional CCTV cameras, but kind of CCTV on steroids, because sometimes there's the smart 
technology and you can't see right now, but I, I'm doing air quotes for, for smart because it's not so smart after all, but these smart surveillance cameras, uh, we're seeing uh, biometric analytics being applied retrospectively. Um, and we're seeing sensors often as part of, again, in inverted commas, smart city projects where really what, what's being rolled out is widespread surveillance infrastructures. And this issue of permanently identifying us isn't the only issue in biometric mass surveillance, although, of course, this destruction of our anonymity um, and the chilling effect that comes with it is a huge issue. Uh, but also we're seeing these systems being used to analyze and judge us uh, on the basis of how we look, um, whether that's putting us into boxes in order to sell to us because we look like somebody that might buy a particular product, um, or all the way through to deciding if we look like a security risk, if we look like a terrorist. And sometimes some of these systems even claim to know our emotions, what we're thinking, or how we're going to act in the future based really on total junk science. Um, so briefly, I'm just gonna explore some of the facets that actually make up biometric mass surveillance and give some of those real examples that I talked about. So the kind of general monitoring use cases is one of the main methods of BMS that we're seeing across Europe. Um, we're so worried about it, and it's not just us, it's, you know, we've got the UN's High Commissioner for Human Rights and several UN Special Rapporteurs have spoken out about what a risk it poses to people's rights, um, how it can threaten journalists and their ability to you know, speak to sources, how it can threaten human rights defenders and stop them from doing their work. Um, and that's actually led the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights to say that it should be banned, um, these BMS practices. In Europe, we've seen this kind of general monitoring, monitoring being used against people who are expressing their legitimate right to protest at a minimum in Slovenia, Germany, Sweden, the UK and Serbia. But we have suspicions that it's even broader than this. Um, but often it's so hard to get information about what's actually happening because it gets hidden and buried. Um, and on a kind of broader global context, we've seen it being used, for example, against Black Lives Matter protesters in the US and against pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong and Russia um, with really, really chilling results and you know, the real disincentivization of people's ability to express their rights and freedoms and raise their voices against government practices that they don't agree with. Uh, in Germany specifically, for example, we've got so many examples, but just a couple. We've actually seen this facial recognition being used outside places of worship um, and outside queer bars. So if you think about the capacity for these systems, not just to identify and target people, but also to link them to protected characteristics like their religion or their sexual orientation, the potential for discrimination and misuse is just enormous. Um, you know, the use of these general monitoring systems treat all of us as guilty until proven innocent in a twisted trial by algorithm, which goes against the rule of law, our fundamental principles of democracy and, and also due process. It's something that often gets forgotten when we're talking about biometric mass surveillance. But part of having, um, you know, a, a democratic society means having investigations being done into criminals or, or suspects in a way that has accountability, that follows rules, follows due process. And we've even spoken to some police officers off the record who have said that they feel that this quick resort to facial recognition is a bit like a shortcut. It's an attempt to get away from following processes, um, doing more re you know, resource intensive and complex police work. And some of them have actually said to us that they prefer good old fashioned police work because it works better. And it's more likely to get justice for victims than this attempt to kind of shortcut these democratic and procedural processes. Another facet that's often linked to biometric mass surveillance and that we saw in the video at the beginning um, is this issue of predictive policing and how kind of discriminatory patterns of who gets 
targeted for police intervention, who gets stopped and searched, um, and how that then gets encoded and amplified as multiple systems across policing, but often also linked with uh, social services and welfare systems, and how it really amplifies and concretizes these discriminatory patterns. Um, so yeah, we're not just talking here about bias in the sense that facial recognition and other biometric systems are less accurate for people of colour, although we know that they are, and we know that the more that biometric systems are used in our society, uh, the more of a risk there is for certain people to be pushed out. Um, everything from you know, it not working as well on certain skin colours, but also if you've got biometric kiosks for people to identify themselves and it's not been set at the right height for people with uh, certain disabilities, like people in a wheelchair, um, or it's not configured to work well for manual labourers whose fingerprints, for example, uh, can often be less readable. So you know, there's a whole world of potential discrimination, but even more so than that, um, and again, I think as the video uh, fantastically touched on, the bigger issue is how these systems are systematically disproportionately deployed uh, against certain communities. Um, really chillingly, we've seen across Europe that people who are on the margins of our societies are the ones that are most experimented with and subjected to these technologies and um, people who often have the least power to be able to speak up against it. So. To just give a couple of examples, in the city of Como in Italy, we've seen smart systems used to detect if migrants are loitering in a park, um, which is an incredibly inhumane response to a humanitarian issue. Um, and that in itself is a wider trend that we see with this tech, is the attempt to try and shortcut these you know, more meaningful sustainable interventions into social problems um, instead with a quick fix that's offered by a tech company that stands to profit from these systems being everywhere. And speaking of those companies that profit, there's one in Spain, for example, called Herta Security. They're a biometric surveillance company and they advertise and we've been calling this out for over a year and they're continuing, they still haven't taken it off their website, advertising that they do racial profiling for both law enforcement surveillance purposes and also commercial purposes, so shopping, advertising. Um, and when we challenged them about it, they said, oh, well, we don't use that feature within the EU. It's just people outside of the EU that get racially profiled by our technology. Another issue that kind of underpins biometric mass surveillance is the issue of biometric IDs. Um, and that's because biometric IDs, you know, the more that all of us have identity cards, identity documents that contain our sensitive biometric data, the more the conditions are created for us to be permanently and constantly identified everywhere we go, every person we meet with, even years later, um, to never be able to have privacy again. Um, and just two examples are the Netherlands and France, where we're seeing this boom in huge biometric mass surveillance database or biometric databases. Um, and we've seen in, in some of these databases a systemic inclusion of people who've never been convicted um, being put in these criminal or kind of quasi-criminal databases. So what we were saying earlier about these systems treating people as criminals um, is exactly what we're seeing in practice. Uh, Poland is another good example where some research that we commissioned earlier this year showed that biometric identity cards, which were rolled out even for children as young as 12, um, on using the justification of national security, that's what the government said when they brought these cards in, have only ever been used for access to services. So again, we're seeing this trend of how national security and peeping, keeping people safe is used as the excuse. Um, and in reality, our ability to take part in public life, our ability to access welfare or other services is actually what is being controlled here. Uh, we then have border biometrics. And for me, this is one of the most harrowing and kind of dystopian examples that we come across because we're seeing EU member states and the, EU's, the EU itself using public money 
to conduct biometric surveillance experiments against people on the move. Um, it's often people seeking asylum. One really egregious example of that is called eye border control, um, in which German MEP Patrick Breyer uh, actually took to court recently um, because there was complete secrecy shrouding this project, eye border control, that was funded with millions of euros of public money um, and which was trying to predict or detect if people uh, on the move, uh, people seeking visas, were telling the truth or if they were lying in their immigration interviews, um, which, you know, going back to my point earlier, lacks a credible scientific foundation and is part of this broader pattern of you know, people in vulnerable positions being used to experiment on. Um, and another related story broke just a few days ago, uh, just before Christmas, about the Centaur project, which is another partially EU funded project in Greek refugee camps. So against people who are in incredibly vulnerable situations um, and they're rolling out these systems, which include uh, a lot of biometric surveillance uh, for identifying threats. So rather than investing in you know, the sorts of resources and help that these people who are in these already uh, really punitive situations uh, are in. They're just investing in yet more technology to further punish uh, people um, at the edges of Europe. And then kind of my last case study is around social media and other online scraping. Um, and that's because this is one of the final puzzle pieces in how we're seeing biometric mass surveillance explode across Europe. Um, and this is where most of us, many of us are having our faces scraped from our social media profiles. Uh, even if we're not on them, we've seen people being scraped from their friends' social media profiles, if they're in the background of a photo, for example, um, creating these vast databases that are not compatible with EU data protection law, uh, but that hasn't stopped companies like Clearview AI from creating these databases and selling their services. We know that Clearview AI is used by several EU police forces um, and some of the Reclaim Your Face coalition has been fighting back against that, um, raising complaints and, and trying to take action. Uh, we've also got PIMIS, which is a bit like Clearview AI, except it's uh, able to be used by individuals out the potential for stalkers for harassment if any random person on the street when you walk down when you sit in a coffee shop can identify you and find out personal information about you um, it's really scary and then other kind of online scraping that you know biometric mass surveillance connects to um, we see an example such as a company called Cogniware in Czechia uh, which is a company that offers a service called Insights Cogniware Insights and we know it's being sold or is kind of in use by the Czech police. And although we don't know exactly what functionality the Czech police are using through that Cogniware Insights, uh, it is a facial recognition system. Um, and the company on their website advertised that they can connect people using facial recognition, not just to that person's identity, but also to information about that person's colleagues the meetings they've been to, where they've driven, their predicted emotions, you know, all sorts of incredibly invasive information about people. So <laughs> without wanting to be too doom and gloom, um, hope is not lost. There is so much that we can do about this. You know, we've established why biometric mass surveillance is a problem. Um, and so being a bit more hopeful, I want to share a little bit about how we're taking action and fighting back. And that's where the Reclaim Your Face Coalition of all these organisations comes in, tirelessly investigating, taking companies and governments to court, doing research, analysis, organising all sorts of manifestations and public events and organising across different social justice and human rights groups to try and take Um, so this is just a tiny snippet because we've got this big coalition who have all been engaged in so many acts of resistance, but just to show a couple of them, um, we've got Digital Freiheit who did this fantastic uh, demonstration with their 
camera heads kind of tr trying to highlight the problem. Um, and then you see all these people with paper bags on their heads. And that's part of the paper bag society stunt that a lot of the organizations in the coalition have run um, to just try and show how ridiculous biometric mass surveillance is. The fact that when it's in our public spaces, we can't avoid it, we can't escape it. And the only thing we can do is put a bag on our head. And of course, that's not practical, that's not safe, um, that's not a good idea. And so it's a, a fun stunt, but with a serious message underlying it, which is that the only way to actually protect us is not to rely on individual responsibility, but to call on the EU to ban these biometric mass surveillance practices. Uh, there's been other acts of resistance. Um, this one called uh, Paolo Surio is a, sorry, by artist Paolo Surio is a, an art installation called Capture, um, where Paolo, who's one of the uh, members of our coalition, created this really provocative piece of art that stirred up a huge reaction in France um, and made a really critical point about facial recognition. Paolo decided to turn the camera back on police officers um, and to capture their faces and to ask the public to identify these people to, to do a manual form of facial recognition. And there was an outcry, um, there was censorship of his exhibit, um, uh, which I think really shows how much you know, some of our states don't want us challenging them, don't want us turning the camera back on them. Um, but as you can see here, you know, these are real life photos of police officers carrying out their duties in France, um, some of them uh, policing protests, for example. And, you know, I think it's quite powerful to stare down the barrel of a gun and, and realise why it's so dangerous and how it further heightens the imbalance of power between us and our governments if they have this technology to use against us, when really instead we should be focusing on transparency and accountability. Um, so moving on to the political dimension, I'm getting close to the end of my slides now, um, so bear with me. Uh, really what I want to emphasize here is why we should do something right now. And that's because we have something called the Artificial Intelligence Act, which is a new law that the EU proposed at the beginning of this year. And the EU have chosen to deal with issues of biometric surveillance, including practices that we say would clearly amount to biometric mass surveillance in the Artificial Intelligence Act. And we've already had some great successes. We've had an in principle prohibition of some forms of BMS, so specifically remote biometric identification by law enforcement prohibited in the draft AI Act. And the European Commission actually specifically said that civil society, like the Reclaim Your Face Coalition, played a big role in getting this prohibition into the draft act, which is fantastic news. Uh, but at the same time, we've got pushback, and we've got resistance from countries um, and from uh, certain ministries that are trying to weaken this prohibition, when in fact we should be strengthening it because it's a good start, but it's not where it needs to be. It's not currently going to protect people's rights and freedoms. So we have this window to act, to convince our governments, um, to put pressure on our governments. Um, and so, yeah, that, that really is, is, is why we have this moment to make history before this law gets passed. It's, it's being negotiated now and it will be fought a lot next year. Um, so we need all the help we can get. Uh, but we've also got some other developments across the EU law and policy space. Uh, we had the European Parliament adopt a report a few months ago where they said that we should ban biometric mass surveillance in the EU. Um, and we've had a couple of national successes as well. Of course, the newish German government coalition's commitment against biometric mass surveillance was uh, a fantastic symbol. Um, Italy has also had a symbolic moratorium on facial recognition and biometric mass surveillance laws that were being introduced in Portugal and Serbia have both been scrapped. So there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful and a lot of momentum, um, but this is also a crucial time for us to be able to make a difference. So one of the major ways that we are trying to do this and where we need your help is with our European Citizens Initiative, um, also known as an ECI. And an ECI is kind of somewhere between a petition and voting. Um, so it's actually an official legal instrument for 
participatory democracy in EU laws and policies. So it's created by the EU, it's given to citizens by the EU. Um, and if you succeed in your ECI, so that means you get 1 million signatures and reach a minimum threshold in seven countries, then the EU has to put your topic on the political agenda. You go and you meet with the European Commission, there can be a debate in the Parliament, um, you're really kind of showing the EU and, and making sure that they take notice of your topic. So in our case, biometric mass surveillance. So by running an ECI, which we've been doing uh, throughout this year, we have a chance to push and encourage national governments and the EU to ban biometric mass surveillance, which will make a difference, not just for now, but for future generations. Um, and it's an expression of solidarity for all those that can't participate because it is limited to EU citizens. Um, whereas the, a lot of the people, as I've already explained, um, that are affected by biometric mass surveillance are actually people who are not EU citizens. Um, so people that are most harmed are the ones that need us, those of us that can, to raise our voices. And the ECI is a fantastic way to raise your voice. Um, so what about, oh, sorry. Our ECI specifically. Uh, we have it online. Um, you can also sign on paper. It's been running for most of this year. People can sign it in 15 European languages. And we also have resources in some other dialects, for example, uh, Romani dialect. But you can only sign the ECI in an official EU language, but it's all on our website. Um, and in case you're wondering how we're doing so far, uh, these are our top seven countries in terms of those that are closest to reaching the threshold that we need of signatures to succeed in our ECI. And we still have about seven months to go. Um, so a huge well done to Germany and to all the organisations that have been campaigning so hard in Germany for Reclaim Your Face, because it's thanks to them that we're at almost 43% of our threshold for Germany. Uh, but we do have a big way to go. Overall, we have just under 65,000 signatures and we need a million. Um, so we really do need your help. We've got all our evidence is here. We've got our arguments, but we need to get the message out and we need to convince people beyond um, our kind of privacy and data protection space and you know, get our grandmas and our uncles and our cousins and the person that runs the shop down our road you know, equally convinced about why this is a problem and why we need to act. And signing the ECI is one really easy way that people can do that. So how can you help? Well, you can join Reclaim Your Face if you're an organization or if you're an individual, you can support the organizations that are already in the campaign by volunteering for them, donating to them, doing research or investigations for them. You can spread the word and raise awareness across your network. And we have resources that we make available for this. You can kind of help us translate stuff. You can create resources. You can help us collect signatures online or on paper. We've got boot camps coming um, in the first quarter of next year where you can get trained up in how to collect ECI signatures in a data protective way um, and also be a part of our community. Um, you can write to local or na national representatives to ask them for a city ban on biometric mass surveillance. We have templates for that. Um, and you'll find all of these things and more on our website. So I've, I've linked there to a bit of information about it um, and our email address if you wanna get in touch with the coordinators. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my bit done. A huge thank you um, from the 68 of organizations and thousands of people in the Reclaim Your Face campaign. And yeah, you can go to our website right now and sign and join us and be a part of the movement. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was quite shocking. There were actually a few details that I did not know about. Um, uh, yeah, crazy, crazy stuff happening there. Um, okay, I don't have your picture right now. Still have your your screen background, but I guess you're still with us, eh? Um, I'm still here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think they come again. Yeah, thank you. That was very, very detailed. Um, and I do think that even even here at the uh, Congress, at the RC3 experience, there are still, still some things that uh, people did not know. Um, 
Yes, we do have a, a guest here. It is um, Andreas Geppert from the Digitale Gesellschaft of Switzerland. And um, he will uh, tell us a bit about how things are going over there in Switzerland. And... Uh, come on. Um, yeah, getting old. Okay, sorry. Something is definitely not happening here. Yeah. Come on. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah, so... Uh, Welcome, Andreas Geppert from uh, Digitale Gesellschaft Switzerland, and uh, back in a minute. Thank you, Ipang. Yeah, I'd like to give you a quick overview um, on the Swiss um, perspective, what um, Reclaim Your Face is doing in Switzerland. Um, so, in Switzerland, um, the situation is so that, that face recognition and biometric um, identification are not allowed. Um, there's no, there's no, in the sense there's no legal basis currently that would allow um, police or, or law enforcement to do it, but it's also not forbidden. So it's a bit unclear um, what the situation actually is, and uh, that allows um, police departments, for example, to experiment with it. Um, we know that that it has been used on an experimental basis. And, of course, these experiments tend to turn into regular practice, um, and that's something we, we want to avoid. Um, to that end, Digitale Gesellschaft Switzerland has joined Reclaim, Reclaim Your Face um, early on, with a view to achieve a ban of um, biometric mass, mass surveillance and um, face recognition also in Switzerland. Um, and um, DigiGuest is also part of the ECA um, right from the beginning. So you might ask, as Ella has mentioned, it's, it's an EU thing. Um, you might know that uh, Switzerland is not part of the EU. So why are we, are, why are we a part of the ECI? Um, actually, um, you don't have to be an EU resident. You, if you are a citizen, um, if you have a citizenship, of an EU country you are entitled to sign. And um, so what we do, we collect signatures um, among the EU citizens living in Switzerland. So um, Swiss residents, but EU citizens. Um, additionally, or we, we are um, encouraging people to, to sign very, via various um, channels. So in addition to blog posts, for example, or newsletters, um, these are our um, winter congress where we reach typically a couple of hundred people. Um, uh, for example, in this year's winter congress in February, we had a talk and a, and a podium, and um, there will be um, presentations on Reclaim Your Face and the ECI um, in next year's winter congress as well. Um, also, we had recently a round table, um, a stammtisch uh, in German, in November 21, um, also about uh, face recognition and, and reclaim your face. In addition, um, we have, um, on, a, on a national level, we have um, a reclaim your face collaboration with other partners, um, namely Algorithm Watch Switzerland and the Swiss section of Amnesty International. Um, Algorithm Watch and AI are both um, partners of Reclaim Your Face and, um, as well. And uh, this alliance has started a national campaign, a campaign um, namely a petition in November 2021. It's called in German, it's called Grundrechte schützen, Gesichtserkennung stoppen. So the, the aim is um, a ban of biometric mass surveillance and face recognition in Switzerland. Um, in, in addition, there have been, or in, as, as in the context of that campaign, there have been postulates uh, requesting a, a ban of biometric surveillance in selected cities, um, submitted by um, local politicians, 
um, members of the local parliaments, for example. The two cities have been Lausanne and Zurich. And um, why these two? Um, it was important that, that we have two cities, um, one each from the, the um, two, two large parts, the French-speaking uh, part, which is Lausanne, and, um, and one from the German-speaking part, Zurich. Um, unfortunately, we don't have one yet from the Italian-speaking part. Uh, maybe or hopefully that will come later. Um, also, the, um, the, there's a good chance in both both cities that we um, that we get a majority um, based on the on the political um, majorities in these cities that we get um, um, that the that the bank um, comes through. Uh, we hope that there will be further cities um, in the future. Um, once uh, we have, hopefully, we have, we have achieved a ban on the local level, we will take it to the next level, which would be the, the cantons, and finally the federal level, um, hopefully in the future. So if you're, if you're watching this, um, and if, you, if you're a Swiss citizen, um, please uh, sign the petition. Um, the, the link is, the URL is um, gesichtserkennungstoppen.ch. Um, and um, I don't know if the, the slides will be available, but the, the link will then be there on the slides as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, yeah, not a part of the EU, but uh, the same problems, <laughs> the same questions. Um, thank you very much uh, for that uh, uh, update. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we have a, a little video message from our friends in Italy. So uh, we'll have a look how things are going there. They have some uh, successes as well, but uh, yeah, um, have a look at it for, for yourself. 2021 has been a great year for the Italian National Coalition of Reclaim Your Face. Uh, we managed finally to have public events, to, to enter into our public spaces and for example in this picture you can see uh, where we stage our actions of paperback society so we wanted to raise awareness uh, towards the public of how our societies might look like in the future if we don't act now against biometric surveillance uh, when it comes instead to results and our direct advocacy uh, we see for sure this is as one of the biggest news so our Italian Data Protection Authority intervened against a university in Italy which was using proctoring softwares to monitor students while doing exams. So the Data Protection Authority basically said that this university, the University of Bocconi, didn't have a legal basis to process biometric data of their students. So while taking exams, this software was monitoring their face, checking that their face was still in front of their monitors. And this is something that was illegal. And this was a, a great win. Uh, for Italy and also it shows that the biometric surveillance is entering into all sorts of areas, including universities, for example. Another great result of our uh, national coalition was the introduction of a moratorium in a recent law introduced at the beginning of December. This moratorium, it's a, a great initial step because it shows that the, the subject of biometric surveillance is something that is, is reaching uh, the politicians and they are willing to act. However, this temporary ban um, has some caveats, huge caveats. Uh, for example, uh, this law doesn't include systems such as those developed by Clearview AI. At the same time, the, the good news is that this temporary ban applies to all private sorts of entities and also some public authorities. Uh, it's, it's going on until December 2023 and it applies to video surveillance systems that use facial recognition technologies in public spaces and public accessible spaces. So this means, for example, uh, sports centers, shopping malls, public transports, all these sorts of areas of public spaces uh, won't be under the monitoring of this kind of facial recognition technologies. At the same time, there are two major drawbacks from this law, which is the first one is that the police can use this kind of technologies subject to a case by case approval by the Italian Data Protection Authority. The other one is that judicial authorities and public prosecutors instead, they can do whatever they want. So basically they are exempted from any sorts of preemptive control. And these two uh, exemptions are quite worrisome uh, 
uh, from our perspective. Another activity that we did as the Hermes Center in Italy that I did together with my colleague Laura Carrere was a, a research regarding the use of and collection of biometric data belonging to migrants. Uh, this, this was a fascinating work because it shows that the technological infrastructure of Italy when it comes to dealing with migrants is basically one of uh, full criminalization. What does it mean? It means that the pictures and fingerprints are included in the same database in which there are criminals like uh, thieves, killers and so on. So basically, migrants that arrive in Italy, asylum seekers that apply for protection in Italy, but also uh, visa holders, so foreigners that come to live in Italy, uh, are basically all included in a database which is called AFIS. Uh, this AFIS database is used during police investigations and the facial recognition system used by the Italian police search phases in this very same database. So this is a real criminalization of foreigners that is happening in Italy. So again, uh, these actions, these activities shows that um, a moratorium isn't enough. So the temporary ban that is, uh, the Italy introduced is not enough. Uh, first of all, because these broad exemptions for criminal investigations are unacceptable, they're too broad. And at the same time, because we need to remember that biometric surveillance is not only facial recognition. There are other sorts of surveillance uh, that use our biometric data. And at the same time, the very uh, existence of biometric data, for example, as, as in the case of migrants, is something that we should take into account and we should act against. So that's why we are still calling for a ban. Yes, thank you, Ricardo from Italy. Um, Usually we do some kind of... Hello, Arsi Fui, okay. and we go directly to Bielefeld. I work with Digital Courage as a campaigner. I am happy to be partner on the Reclaim Your Face team and work towards a ban on facial recognition and other forms of biometric mass surveillance with this amazing team. Campaigning during the pandemic has been quite challenging for us because we couldn't organize as many in-person events as we would normally like to do. However, um, this summer when I uh, got to speak at Untalba in Berlin, that was one of the highlights because it allowed us to engage with people in person, to have conversations with other activists that want to strive for a more healthy democracy and see that a lot of them would support our um, demand for a ban of biometric mass surveillance. At other times, we would choose more indirect forms of communication to get the word out. For example, at the Paperback Society challenge that we participated in, for example, in Brussels, in Bielefeld, okay. in Okay, I was going to say that's weird because I can see myself, but yeah, if you can see me now, that's good. We would pose in front of landmarks, do group photos, I've also been checking. and take other We've pictures had, um, to satirically oh, portray a society that is under constant surveillance where people cannot leave the house without masking their head. Together with the ETRI network, we also contacted members of the European Parliament to tell them that we are closely watching how they are regulating artificial intelligence in the upcoming AI Act. We want to make sure that they know we demand strong regulation that protects our fundamental rights and freedoms. Meanwhile, in Germany, there were federal elections and we drafted a position paper in which we carried the Reclaim Your Face demands towards German politics. We told politicians and political parties that we expect them to reject the datafication of our faces and bodies and that we want um, a clear statement against biometric mass surveillance. And we were quite happy that we found out uh, that the new coalition plans to reject biometric surveillance in public spaces. That was the result of a strong civil society in Germany, among others the uh, CCC, uh, Digitale Gesellschaft and us um, carrying these demands towards Berlin and having conversations with um, digital politics representatives of the political parties. We know that uh, facial recognition and similar technologies invade on our privacy on a mass scale and that they amplify discrimination. That's why we also fight biometric mass surveillance in other forms. For example, last year at the RC3, we presented the Perso ohne Finger campaign, in which we all, uh, called upon uh, people to make a new ID before a new law takes effect. This law would regulate that every citizen has to record their fingerprint on their ID card. And we believe that is an unjustifiable infringement of our rights. 
we were quite thrilled to see that a lot of you followed our call to action because this bought us time. Now we're suing in court against this new regulation and we're hoping that eventually the Court of Justice of the European Union will decide to strike it down. Just one more thing. If we want to get the European Commission and member states to respect our rights and follow suit on our demands, we need to work together. So please join us and sign the Reclaim Your Face ECI and tell everyone about it if you haven't done that already. And then have a great uh, RC3. Okay, so uh, thank you, Konstantin. Uh, welcome back, Ella. We only have a few minutes, uh, so um, we'll try to answer some, some questions from our online audience. And the first one I can answer myself, uh, the introduction video. It is available in three languages. It is in uh, German, in English, and in Italian. And if you know some uh, sound engineers and speakers or whatever, uh, there's always a possibility to, to produce another language. Also, there are... Um, I think right now we are at 12 languages uh, in subtitles. So um, um, I hope one of the languages is uh, understandable for you. Um, and if there's a language missing, you can um, still get in touch with the, with the producers of this video and um, do subtitle in your language. The second question uh, was, how do I mess with cameras the best? Is there a possibility to hide from... Uh, biometric cameras. I know that the masks alone are not enough anymore. Ella, can, can you give us some, some tips on uh, staying anonymous in public? For sure. And yeah, you're totally right about the masks. Actually, there's one company in particular um, that got a seal of excellence from the European Commission during the pandemic for making their facial recognition five times more accurate during the pandemic with people wearing masks because they invested in um, being able to identify people just from that little strip of their face. So yeah, a mask is no longer going to cut it. Um, we've seen some awesome acts of kind of resistance and camouflage against these surveillance cameras. Um, there's a project called CV Dazzle um, by some activists and artists where people have, have experimented with using hairstyles, face paint, contouring, kind of dramatic makeup as a way to fool the cameras. Um, so that can work. Uh, there are some people who've developed either sunglasses that um, have lights in them that kind of scramble the cameras um, and also fabrics like scarves that you can wear around your neck and your head that will actually um, also mess with the cameras. Um, we've also done some of our own research into uh, messing with the cameras. We created a face mask for the Reclaim Your Face campaign, um, which we gave to people that donated to help us with our fight. Um, and that also had a pattern in it that would scramble some facial recognition algorithms. But the big issue here is that these systems are constantly under development. They're constantly being improved. A lot of them are not, uh, are not publicly available, the kind of um, systems. So it's really, really hard to have a method of resistance that's going to work against all the different types of biometric mass surveillance. And so really that's why we say we need a legal ban because as an individual, there are things you can do, um, but this is a political question. Um, it, you know, unless you're gonna put a paper bag on your head or, or take yourself out of society, really we need to stop this being done, You know, tackle it at the root. Um, and that's why we have the ECI, which calls for a law that will protect us. Yes, I think uh, the next speaker here at Seabase, uh, she will try to hide herself uh, behind makeup. That uh, could could be interesting. Uh, one more question was, um, are these issues also tackled on a more international level, like uh, uh, at the United Nations? So like a yeah. worldwide ban on uh, uh, surveillance? Absolutely. There's actually a coalition that we're a part of called uh, Ban Biometric Mass, uh, sorry, Ban Biometric Surveillance or Ban BS. And that's a coalition of over 200 organizations globally campaigning for the same thing. Um, and different organizations are working in different fora. So there, there, is, there are discussions happening at the United Nations. 
Um, we have some special rapporteurs um, that we're working with um, who are kind of some of the human rights experts of the United Nations who have already been speaking out against biometric mass surveillance and, and we're hoping to do more with them. Um, we've got organizations uh, like Amnesty International who are doing projects in um, New York, in India, um, and awesome organizations like, uh, uh, I can't remember the name, but there's, there's organizations in India who are doing a lot of work about biometric mass surveillance there because India is actually one of the most biometrically surveilled countries in the world. So absolutely, this is a global thing. And for, for those of you that are interested in, in laws like the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, we saw the GDPR have a knock-on effect around the world. And we really hope if we can get a strong law against biometric mass surveillance in the EU, that that might also help push the needle in other jurisdictions that sometimes look to the EU for, for leading the way in privacy and data protection. Yes, and as far as I know, there are some cities in the United States that already banned uh, the use of cameras in public, right? There are, and a lot of the places where there are bans um, on facial recognition and other biometric surveillance in public are cities where there are a high proportion of tech startups, which I think is, is pretty telling that the people who are creating this tech are the ones that, that don't want it because they know how dangerous it can be. Um, but some cities, uh, like Portland, for example, have did some fantastic work where they uh, did a lot of outreach into the community. They spoke to the queer community, the Latinx community in Portland, um, lots of different people that you know, have historically been targeted by the police, for example, or who've been marginalized. And they had a resounding message from, from people in Portland that they don't want this technology. They don't want to be treated as walking barcodes and suspects. And so they decided to ban it. Um, so really, uh, the EU and across Europe, we're, we're lagging behind a bit. So we've got a long way to go. OK, I'll, I'll see. Uh, it is um, almost 10 o'clock. So we have to wrap it up here. Uh, thank you so much, Ella, for, for joining us here and um, giving us uh, so detailed information on the whole thing. Uh, thanks a lot. And I yeah, wish you a good start in the new year. Uh, and of course, thank you to um, Andreas, who, who joined us here uh, from uh, Digitale Gesellschaft Switzerland. Thanks to the Seabase for hosting us once more. Okay, I think, I think the next people are preparing, so I say... Um, yeah, yeah, so we'll finish here and uh, we have one more video to motivate you and please sign this petition. Thank you very much. Uh, licensed under a CC by 4.0 and it is all for the community to download for everybody